The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, fleeting acquaintance turns into lifelong friends when you eat their souls. Astronautical jumping beans and super stealthy prison shanks made from fermionic condensates. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Intern Charlie Smith. Hi, Charlie. This time, Bain Consulting Editor David F. Sherrad talks to Editor Alex Schwartzman and writers Esther Friesner, Jody Lynn Nye, Gina Koch, and Laura Resnick about a great new anthology out from Bain. That book is called The Cackle of Cthulhu, and it is, you guessed it, humor and light-sided takes on the Cthulhu mythos from the loquacious, rococo, and sumptuous H.P. Lovecraft. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Leiden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. But first, here's the news. Hey, the new Bane ebook e-arcs are out for January. Now, an e-arc is the scream you hear after you've made a telephone conference call to yourself in both the past and the future, and then recorded it and played it back to your mother before you were born. No, that's not right. No? An eARC is actually an electronic advanced reader copy of a book that will be coming out in print and ebook form in a few months from now. We will sell this to you in all its unproofread glory over at Bain eBooks so you can experience the work of some really great authors and get the latest book in your favorite series early, early, early. Yes, that's what it really is, Charlie. You're right. Out now in eARC is the Starfire series Oblivion eARC by Steve White and Charles E. Gannon. Tell us about that one, Charlie. The war with the profoundly alien Arduans has ended, and the Arduans have come to call humanity their allies. Well, most of them. The Arduan warrior caste refuses to accept defeat. Now known as the Kaituni, they are waging a war of extermination against all members of the pan-sentient union, human and Arduan alike. Now the Kaituni are at the doorstep of the heart worlds, soul, and earth, Alpha Centauri. The odds look bleak, but Admiral Ian Trevane and Commodore Ossian Weathermere have faced down long odds in the past. It's time to take a stand for Earth, for humanity, and for the pan-sentient union. Also out in eARC is the Witchy Winter eARC by DJ Butler. Now this is the sequel to Dave's wonderful debut last year, Witchy Eye. Toil and trouble, Sarah Calhoun paid a hard price for her entry onto the stage of the Empire's politics, but she survived. Now she rides north into the Ohio and her father's kingdom, Cahokia. To win the Serpent Throne, she'll have to defeat seven other candidates, win over the kingdom's regent, and earn the will of a hidden goddess while mastering her people's inscrutable ways and watching her own back. It's a great adventure in an alternate North American past filled with muskets and magic from the extremely talented D.J. Butler. Witchy Winter e by D.J. Butler and Oblivion e by Steve White and Charles E. Gannon are now available exclusively at Bain eBooks. They will go away once the eBooks are out there in April, so get them now. Absolutely. Hey, Alex, knock, knock. Who's there? Cthul. Cthul who? Exactly. Hey, everybody, it's David F. Shirod here on the Bain Free Radio Hour, and we are talking about the new anthology from Bain Books, The Cackle of Cthulhu. It's a uh, collection of humorous H.P. Lovecraft-inspired fiction edited by Mr. Alex Schwartzman, who is here on the line with us today. Uh, Alex is a writer, translator, and game designer from Brooklyn, New York. Over 100 of his short stories have appeared in Nature, Galaxy's Edge, Intergalactic Medicine Show, and many other magazines and anthologies. He won the 2014 WSFA Small Press Award for Short Fiction and was a finalist for the 2015 Canopus Award for Excellence in Interstellar Fiction. He is the editor of the Unidentified Funny Objects Annual Anthology Series of Humorous Science Fiction and Fantasy. His collection, Explaining Cthulhu to Grandma and Other Stories, and his steampunk humor novella, H.G. Wells' Secret Agents, were both published in 2015, and as I said, he is the editor of The Cackle of Cthulhu. Alex, uh, thanks so much for coming on and talking about the book with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this release. 
And also joining us are some of the contributors to Cackle of Cthulhu. First up, uh, Esther Friesner. She is an author of over 40 novels and almost 200 short stories and a Nebula Award winner. She's also a poet, a playwright, and the editor of several anthologies. The best known of these is the Chicks and Chainmail series uh, that she created and edits for Bain Books. We talked about that a while back here on the podcast. Uh, the sixth book, Chicks and Balances, appeared in July 2015. Deception's Pawn, uh, the latest title in her popular Princess of Myth series of young adult novels from Randall, excuse me, Random House, was published in April of 2015. Esther, thanks for uh, being back on. Good to talk with you again. Well, it is my pleasure to be here. Also joining us is Laura Resnick. She is the author of the popular Esther Diamond urban fantasy series, including books such as Doppelgangster, Vampirazzi, Abracadaver, and the upcoming Goldzilla. She has also written traditional fantasy novels such as In Legend Born, The Destroyer Goddess, and The White Dragon, which made multiple years best lists. The Campbell, she is also the Campbell Award-winning short st- excuse me, award-winning author of many short stories, including one in Cackle of Cthulhu. Uh, Laura, thanks for uh, coming on to the Bain Free Radio Hour. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Jody Lynn Nye is here. She lists her main career activity as Spoiling Cats. However, she also has, um, I guess, found time in her free time, not Spoiling Cats, uh, to publish more than 45 books, including collaborations with Anne McCaffrey and Robert Asprin. Uh, as well as she's written over 150 short stories. Her latest books are Rhythm of the Imperium, uh, Moonbeam with Travis Taylor, and Mythfits. Uh, she also teaches the annual Dragon Con two-day writer's workshop. Uh, Jody, it's great to talk with you again. Oh, thanks for having me back. And last but not least, we have Ginny Koch. She writes the fast, fresh, and funny Alien Catherine Kitty Cat series for Daw Books, the Martian Alliance Chronicle series, and the Necropolis Enforcement Files series. Her story in this anthology, which we'll talk about, uh, is called HPME, and it is actually set in the Necropolis Enforcement Files universe, and is a prequel to book one, uh, The Night Beat, and book two in that series called Night Music is forthcoming. Uh, Ginny, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thanks. I'm real, really jazzed about being on the show. All right. Well, I wanted to uh, say we, we're we talking today about um, Cackle of Cthulhu, and this is um, probably one of the more unusual uh, H.P. Lovecraft inspired anthologies to come out. There have been quite a few of them recently. Lovecraft seems to be hotter than ever. Uh, but this one is, uh, I say, pokes gentle fun or po- um, pokes um, sort of playful fun at Lovecraft in the mythos. Um, Alex, you, if I may say, kind of become as- associated uh, with funny science fiction and fantasy with your UFO series. Uh, and you're quite a funny writer yourself. Um, what was it about Lovecraft that appeal to, you know, I don't think initially most people would go, you know, uh, horrific elder gods that drive us insane if we look directly at them. That sounds hilarious. Or maybe most people would, but you did. And why? how did that come about? Well, I, I sort of stumbled into it, honestly. Um, I wrote a story uh, called, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a story called Explaining Cthulhu to Grandma. And part of the inspiration for that story was that I never quite understood the appeal or the concept of Cthulhu as, as this cosmic entity. And so it was a little therapeutic for me to, to write a story about it, which is a funny story. And the story has done incredibly well. That's the story that won me the Wispa Award and was reprinted many, many times over. So I was then asked by a couple of editors to write more funny uh, Lovecraftian, you know, uh, you know, Lovecraftian humor stories. And I did. And I sort of, it sort of very slowly became my thing. And I started thinking, well, there is a demand for, for people want to read this stuff. There's so many dark and, and uh, like uh, you know, dark and scary and, uh, you know, and, and, and nihilistic, really, uh, Lovecraftian fiction out there. Uh, why not make fun of this stuff? I mean, it's so rich with references and with things that are easy to subvert with, with fantasy humor tropes. And that's how the concept of this anthology came to be. And, and a lot of these stories are either reprints or stories written by authors who have established themselves uh, as extremely talented and uh, you know, extremely talented uh, speculative humor authors. So I thought that they would enjoy playing with this theme uh, as much as I do. 
Well, and it's certainly um, fun to read. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Lovecraft, obviously. Um, he's sort of looming over all of this. Um, I remember when I was starting to read... When I was starting to get into horror fiction and, you know, reading where mo- I think a lot of people started, Stephen King, and then going back to Matheson and stuff, and you always hear this name H.P. Lovecraft as the guy from the 20th century, along with Poe in the 19th. And I would go to the library, and we had a pretty good library in Allen, Texas, but there was no H.P. Lovecraft on the shelves. You go to the used bookstore, you couldn't find, I couldn't find any. Barnes & Noble might have one volume with those Michael Whelan covers, and that was it. It was, you couldn't, there was just not a lot available. And now it's like Lovecraft has an entire shelf practically at bookstores. And um, we have so much Lovecraftian fiction coming out. And I wonder, and I just want to throw this to the whole, um, all of you guys here, whoever wants to jump in first. Why do you think it is that here in 2018 now, uh, Lovecraft is enjoying such a renaissance to the point that we can have an entire anthology uh, like lampooning it. Like it's it's a well enough trope that uh, in the science fiction world, and um, at least that uh, people will you can make fun of it and people will get the joke. You know that to me that's that's when you know you've arrived. And yeah, why is it? Do we think that in 2018, Lovecraftian fiction is so popular? Um, I think it it goes back even lo- longer than that, as far as it being a trope. I will confess now to terrible, terrible habits. I watch cartoons. I read (laughs) comic books. I call them comic books and not graphic novels. Is there no end to my perfidy? But anyhow, uh, I remember back when they had a cartoon called The Real Ghostbusters, and that was long Mm -hmm. ago, Mm -hmm. and they had an episode with Cthulhu in it, and people got it. Uh, so it still it goes back there. It may be surfacing more now. I think it goes in waves, such as when Rilia rises from the depths. But um, I, I think that part of the appeal now uh, has always been the appeal of horror itself, which is better fictional horror that we know and that is fictional and that we can draw away from safely and close the book on and be in control of it than real life horror where the dreaded gibbering things are out there in the real world and our control over them is limited. Um, I kind of, I kind of agree with that. Um, for me, I was reading Lovecraft Young, so I guess the the library in Ventura, California, was better than yours in Texas because Probably after was. I read <laughs> after I read through all the mysteries and was bugging the librarians um, for you know why isn't the next Ellery Queen out um, and they couldn't really get through it only comes out once a month and you read it in a day. Uh, to me as being my problem, uh, they shoved me over into the horror section. So I read all through horror and uh, Lovecraft, and Lovecraft was there, Poe was there, everything. Uh, it was it was wonderful. So Lovecraft's always been around for me since I was 12, and I I enjoy writing both serious stuff in the mythos and comedic stuff in the mythos. But I think I, I think uh, Esther's right that it's something that comes in waves where it's it's in it's out it's in it's out but the i don't think it's ever really gone away it's currently having a, a moment but i you know will that moment wane probably but he'll that moment will come again so i just i and i agree i think i i think it's fun i think pe- we like to be scared by something that can't isn't actually going to kill us there is laughter well, in horror, but it's the nervous mm-hmm. kind of laughter. It's the it's the terrified giggle that that you often hear when you're in in a horror movie. I remember seeing the Lovecraft books on the shelf in the bookstore, those horrible melting skull ones with the with the terrified mm-hmm. or, or malevolent eyes, and I wasn't going anywhere near them. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think that there's uh, actually a perfectly reasonable expectation uh, explanation for why there's a lot of Lovecraft stuff happening right now. All of this stuff's in the public domain, but but for a few. So <laughs> it's 
you you can you can have at uh, anything by H.P. Lovecraft that was published before 1923. So uh, people are, in fact, going after it, and it's it's ripe for humor because if you read the list of the elder gods. There are some that are represented only by perhaps a sound or a really uncomfortable feeling, and you could go wild with that. You can absolutely have a lot of fun with the some of some of the wacky and I think really innovative ideas he had for what constitutes one of his pantheon, and it's it's fascinating to think about. But it's also enormously easy to pervert and make fun of. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Lovecraft uh, Lovecraft encouraged people to write in the mythos too. So people have mm-hmm. been able to write in it for much longer than since public domain. So I mm. think that's another reason why it's out there. He he encouraged people to do it. He's one of the few authors that wanted everybody to play in his sandbox. So cool. I think that allows that there is that that's one of the reasons why it can come in waves because someone has always been writing in the mythos. In fact, some of the best mythos stories um, when as you dig in you discover oh Lovecraft didn't actually write that one someone else did yeah so. I know about August Sirleth for one he was one of the most notable of, uh, of mm-hmm. the Lovecraftian uh, pastiches people people who listen to, to these kind of podcasts and who attend conventions uh, and generally our target audience they've always known about Lovecraft uh, he just mm-hmm. wasn't as part of a popular culture of the sort of the greater zeitgeist uh, up until recently, and I think what we've been seeing in the in the recent uh, decade or so is that it has become a concept more than just books. There's a lot. Virtually everyone knows Frankenstein, knows Dracula, but most of those people have never actually read the original material. So I feel mm-hmm. like uh, Cthulhu and the rest of the mythos are now entering that pop culture stage where people are aware of what they are conceptually even if they've never actually read Lovecraft. And that creates a much larger demand, much larger market, I suppose, for uh, for fiction and for anything from plush toys to T-shirts uh, that feature those characters. I think Alex has definitely underlined something that I experienced there because I will confess, I had never read Lovecraft. When Alex asked me to do this story, I was like, sure, I'll do that, and didn't tell him. I'd never actually read any Lovecraft at the time. Mm-hmm. And Neither most of my I. friends, and most of my friends, when it kind of came up, oh, yeah, I'm writing a Lovecraft story right now, they're like, what's that? And they had never even heard of Lovecraft, but when I would say, you know all those, like, you know, memes that you see on the Internet now and shirts and things, Cthulhu or Cthulhu for president or whatever, and they're like, oh, yeah, I know that. They, well, he's the guy who invented Cthulhu. So, yeah, there mm-hmm. is that crossover now definitely of Cthulhu into popular culture among people who've never even heard of Lovecraft, as well as someone like me who'd heard of him my whole life but hadn't read him. Mm-hmm. You know, it, this is uh, – I recently saw on TV – a uh, well, it wasn't quite a cartoon. It was the style of animation that they use in Corpse Bride and Paranorman, mm-hmm. and it was uh, well. All I can think of is it's young Sheldon, except it's young H.P. Lovecraft, and um, <laughs> it's it's very odd. Uh, it, it, he's pretty much bobblehead H.P. Lovecraft and <laughs> Cthulhu, who doesn't know he's Cthulhu. And I was just looking at this uh, in what I can only call the uh, tilted head puppy dog Baru uh, thing, but they (laughs) got somebody to produce this, and they don't produce things if they think there's no audience for it Mm -hmm. because, well, money. Uh, And they must have thought that this was enough a part of popular culture to make not one, but I was later told two of these animated features. One was plenty. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm glad they tried. Um, (laughs) I don't know if that's a rigging endorsement uh, for the one, or anyways, we'll move on. Um, I... uh, (laughs) 
I um, want to talk about some of the stories in the book specifically um, that you all wrote. And since uh, I hear my two, almost three-year-old yelling in the background, and perhaps people listening to the podcast with really good headphones can hear him, uh, maybe let's start with Jody's story, um, my little old one. Um, <laughs> not that he's as bad as Quinted uh, in this story, the the little boy in this story, but I, I I thought that's a perfect that's the universe or the elder gods giving me a great segue. So, um, Jody, your story is about a um, a mother and uh, whose son is a, a toddler. He's a little bit over one. Couple and their horrible child. Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And I, I must say, not that I think I'm all that trendy or my child is horrible, but uh, I feel like you really nailed a, uh, you know, I live in, I think your story set in like, what, Berkeley or something? I live in Austin, the Berkeley of Texas. And uh, I, I I think I know some of these people. Um, so I just wanted you to maybe tell uh, the listeners a little bit about the story and uh, maybe how it came about. <laughs> This, this mother uh, is, is doing all of the right things. She has the right stroller. She has the, the right clothes, the right smartphone. And, of course, this perfectly adorable, beautiful child who happens to be a representation of evil in the way that so many toddlers are. <laughs> but he's, he's something beyond uh, the, the normal. Uh, he's, he's, the, he's the little bruiser that you always see on the playground who's beating up the other children. And... The, the kind of uh, cursory apologies and air kisses just don't do it. They just aren't enough for this woman to be able to control her child, whose name, by the way, is Quentin. And she she is uh, approached by a tall, dark figure in a hooded cloak that uh, offers her something that will help... Uh, when she said the, the child, you know, the child doesn't, hasn't slept through the night since he was born, and the cloaked figure says, "The sleepless one." Uh, there are a lot of uh, Cthulhu, there are a lot of Cthulhu and, and old Elder God uh, memes throughout, and uh, so they give him a little toy that that is uh, trademarked by little old one TM, uh, and and somehow suddenly this is making Quentin a little bit more cooperative and playful. So all of the weak flailings of the parents to control a child who has a stronger will than they do is taken over by this toy. So one by one, uh, the, the neighbors who have uh, children that are that are a little on the disturbing or, or uh, difficult side also fall into wanting one of these toys for their children. So it's it's just I, it's kind of born out of desperation that they find themselves with these <laughs> these terrible ugly toys in their household but it's keeping the kids happy and i think that so many parents would do anything if it would keep their kids from committing mayhem and and being uh well disruptive uh yeah um now do you uh know any uh parents in this uh in this stage of life or is this based off a, a you probably don't want to mention if it was based off a real kid i guess but um um the <laughs> Let's just say that Quentin has an analog in the real world, um, okay. but naturally this, this this child is adorable and precious, and I would never, ever impugn this child in that way. <laughs> yeah, we don't want this. This is going on the internet. It's there forever, so we don't want to name names, probably. Exactly. Um, well, um, I don't want to say too much more than other than... Uh, if you don't know a lot about Lovecraft, you'll still love this story. But if you have read a lot of the mythos, then um, like you mentioned, the sleepless one, there are a lot of fun little <clears throat> hints throughout this um, or not hints, uh, Easter eggs, I guess you would say throughout this uh, for everyone, as with many of these stories in here. Um, I have got to keep an eye on the time. Um, let me uh, switch now and talk to um, Jenny. Um, your story, I want to make sure I get the title right. Where is it? I, I say titles wrong. H H P and me. Yes, and this is set in. Um, this is a crossover story, uh, as I mentioned in your intro, um, from your ne Necropolis Enforcement Files. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that series, and then also how um, how you worked Mister Lovecraft into the into your existing world, and blended the two. Sure. Well, the conceit of the Necropolis Enforcement Files is that um, it, it comes from my place of 
I resent the fact that all of our undead tales, they come out of religion, but we've just shoved religion out. And, I, you know, golems come from Jew, Jewish mythology, vampires and werewolves are Catholic, and so on and so forth. And we just pretend the religion didn't doesn't exist with them, but it does. And I wanted to do something where it, it the religion was taken into account, but also that these these people have the choice in their souls, just like we do. So uh, the conceit on this is that when you die, if you become an undead or um, such as a werewolf who was going to associate with the undead and be on that side because they used to be a person and they're not anymore, um, that they choose at that moment whether they're giving their souls to the gods and monsters or if they're giving it to the prince of darkness. So it's a fight. It's the good good versus evil fight, which makes it sound like not the not fun at all, but it's actually a very funny series. And we follow Victoria Wolf, who is an undercover policewoman in Prosaic City, who is also an undercover officer in Necropolis Enforcement, which is the undead city that is directly under Prosaic. And there's crossover between the worlds and Victoria and her motley gang of undeads and occasional humans have to stop Armageddon from from happening. Now, the other thing is that when anyone dies, they can, if their soul is perceived to be correct, they can become an undead. So H.P. Lovecraft is in this series because he was immediately uh, brought in at his at his death, and you can choose which what you want to be based on um, your your leanings. So sometimes you have a choice. You know, you could be a succubus, or you could be um, a vampire, or you could be whatever. And he's chosen to be a zombie because he thinks it's funny. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> And so HP is in the series as a supporting character the whole way through, and he is a professor at Necropolis University. And he helps in the night beat. He helps Victoria and um, her her what becomes her new team uh, to figure out the uh, the prince's attack led by Lucifer. And in HP and Me, you get to see his first class at Necropolis University that Victoria and some of her friends are taking. And you get to see how they become, how they move from, he's a weirdo professor that we have all have more experience than to, this guy's totally cool and we love him. So, And they do that by going through a portion of hell. <laughs> but it's all laughs. <laughs> Just throw that in there. <laughs> I know it makes it sound when I describe it. I think I've got to find a funnier way to describe this, but um, <laughs> it is very funny because I don't I don't take religion seriously, but it's there, you know. And and uh, so they they've got all that. And Victoria Victoria gets a lot of information from the base of her tail, so because she's a wolf, she has a lot of canine references. So yes, yeah. Thank you for the snicker. Uh, <laughs> Um, so was this a story that you um, uh, I guess I could look at the copyright date if this was this since H.P. Lovecraft was already in a character in your world was this something you wrote specifically for the anthology or was this something that you had kind of worked out as a prequel in your head already uh, that when Alex approached you specifically for the anthology um, okay. I'm, I am I am lucky enough to get to be in a lot of Alex's anthologies and so when they come up, I basically ask him what he wants. Does he want something in the Alien series? Does he want something in my Alexander Outland series, which I write as G.J. Koch? Does he want something in, you know, what does he want? Does he want a standalone? And for this one, he's like, you know, why, you know, what it was, I said, well, we could do something in Necropolis Enforcement because H.P. Lovecraft's already a character. And so he said, yes, we'll do that. So, yeah. So that's why. Right. So yeah, and, this is created only for the anthology. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, sort of, yeah, tailor-made for this. Um, well, let's, um, Alex, circle back to you. Um, <clears throat> we mentioned your story uh, explaining Cthulhu to Grandma and how, in a way, um, at least in 
you know, as this got the ball rolling for you as um, for humorous Lovecraftian fiction and sort of eventually led to us talking about the book today. Um, so uh, when, this takes place in a pawn shop, sort of a um, the oldest pawn shop on earth. And uh, I'll let you say more about it, but I just wonder when was when was that story written and where did it appear? And um, I know you talked about it a little bit already, but if you could just maybe talk a little bit more about it. Sure. Uh, so this story uh, came to be from me binge watching about a season of Porn Stars, which is a, a, a show on the History yeah. Channel that takes place in a pawn shop and people bring all sorts of really wacky items in there. And the, the, the team evaluates these items and sort of makes offers on them. But part of the show is about the interaction between those characters. So I thought that it would be fun to, to write a story that takes place in a magic pawn shop. And in this particular story, so the, the interaction is mainly between the main character, Sylvia, and her grandmother who owns the pawn shop and who has all the experience while Sylvia is young and sort of uh, really trying to prove herself to her grandma. And grandma is very conservative and sort of traditional in the way that she runs the business. She just wants to buy the typical items and, you know, and, and, and sort of uh, just try and, you know, make, you know make, make, make the profit and move on. While Sylvia is always looking for that big deal, the, you know, the deal of a lifetime. And one day, somebody brings uh, Cthulhu into the pawn shop. The Cthulhu is in a pocket dimension, which is shaped like a snowball, uh, like, 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 a, like a snow globe pyramid. So it actually just fits in the palm of her hand, but in the other dimension, Cthulhu is enormous. So she is super excited to, to pick this item up, and she thinks that she's going to make bank on it. And she runs in, and she starts trying to explain Cthulhu to Grandma, who has no idea what this is. And when she finally explains it, Grandma is not impressed. She's like, what are we going to do? Nobody's going to pay money for this thing. At best, we might be able to sell it by the pound to the sushi company. <laughs> so Sylvia is livid about this. She thinks she's right, and she is determined to find the right buyer and make a lot of money reselling uh, this Cthulhu thing. So naturally, she posts it on Craigslist. Mm. And then all sorts of very strange naturally. characters show up uh, seeking to purchase Cthulhu for various reasons, and that's where the, you know, the, the, the meat of the story comes in. Um, I yeah. wrote the story around 2012, and it initially appeared in the Intergalactic Medicine Control magazine. Uh, there is also a couple of sequels. Uh, one of them appeared uh, in IJMS as well, uh, and another is forthcoming this year at Galaxy's Edge. So I do keep writing stories in this pawn shop universe because it's just so much fun, and you can have all kinds of interesting items show up, like Excalibur could show up, Pandora's. Uh, Pandora's box patrol up. So all sorts of these iconic uh, quest items that appear uh, you know, in, in, in fantasy and science fiction, uh, they can all show up at the pawn shop. Yeah, I will confess I also love Pawn Stars. And in my, you know, in my little notebook of ideas, I wrote down something just, to, I was like, Science fiction pawn shop. So uh, I, I will not step on your toes, but I will say people who say reality TV is worthless, well, maybe not. You know, so uh, <laughs> uh, and I guess maybe uh, the main character in here is for those who watch it. She's sort of the <clears throat> grandma thinks of her as the chumley of uh, of this pot shop, I guess. But maybe she's a little bit smarter than that in the end. So um, it's a, lo a lot of fun uh, story. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she thinks of herself as Rick. Grandma sees her as chumley. Maybe in between the two uh, is the truth. So uh, anyways, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, well, let me talk to, uh, let's go to Esther now. Um, Esther, you, one thing I loved about your story, uh, was, um, called the shunned trailer, which first of all, I love the title, but is also that, um, one of the things about Lovecraft that immediately jumps out when you read him is his, um, archaic syntax and grammar and vocabulary that sound, you know, like a thesaurus threw up all over it, um, which adds to, to, you know, some people love it, some people don't, right? I always liked it. I think it adds to the otherworldly weirdness of it. But I think it also, if you push it just a smidge further, becomes hilarious. And uh, you push it a smidge further. And um, there's other stories in the book that do that as well. But I think you really nailed that Lovecraftian um, 
purple prose. Uh, so was that, how did you get in the mode to write that? Did you like bulk up, read a bunch of Lovecraft and then go, or is that something you could slip in no problem or how did that work? And then maybe also just tell us a little bit about the story. Okay. Well, here's the thing of it. I've been doing, uh, horrible things to HP Lovecraft for a long, long time. <laughs> When I read his books, and by the way, I forget if it was Ballantyne who published these or not. I have all of them, uh, including The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, because I think I bought it because there were kitty cats on the front uh, of the book. Uh, anyway, I've been... I blame my parents for not getting me a chemistry set. I couldn't do destruction of things <laughs> any legitimate way, so this is how I do it. Uh, long, long ago, I think it was for a world fantasy um, program book, I did a story called Love's Eldritch Icker, because while reading H.P. <laughs> Lovecraft, tessellated Icker, Eldritch, good heavens, Ungepotschkin. He didn't use that one, but there you have it. <laughs> anyway, I am able to steep myself in, uh, I guess you'd call it the diction of an author, and then go to town on him. So uh, I pretty much have done this to H.P. Lovecraft, not just in the shunned trailer, uh, but in things like uh, The Bow and the Beast, which is a Regency epistolary H.P. Lovecraft story. Um, and then there was the time I read too much noir fiction and did a uh, Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hammett pastiche of H.P. Lovecraft. I knew she was trouble. The moment she ankled into my office, for one thing, she had no ankles. And it went on from there. So I'm pretty much there already for writing the shunned trailer. And in fact, I think at this point I might have enough H.P. Lovecraft pastiche pieces of my own to put together a book. But, well, if there is a just and merciful deity, it might not happen. Uh, so the shunned trailer, obviously, that's a uh, a parody of the shunned house. The protagonist of the shunned trailer, I will preface this by saying um, I was educated in the Seven Sisters and the Ivy League. I have a BA from Vassar. I've got a PhD from Yale, so of course the hero of this is a Harvard man who <laughs> at spring break decides he shall be off to cavort, and he falls afoul of hitching a ride with a car full of Vassar girls, I think. Uh, it doesn't end well for him, and he finds himself coming back to his senses in a strange place. Now, I will also remark that, okay, people, this is humor. So it's not exactly a trailer park as trailer parks actually exist, but it is a trailer park as many people think trailer parks are, especially in the South, uh, especially how Northerners think of yeah. trailer parks in the mm -hmm. South. And it turns out that the people who live in this trailer park are very nice people, and they are very religious. And he has arrived there just in time for one of their big religious get-togethers and festivals. So it's elder gods and potato salad for everybody <laughs> in the trailer park. And, well, hijinks, as they say, ensue. Uh, this also <laughs> took me back to, um, now, I am, I'm born and raised Northeast USA, but I have many, many friends and acquaintances who took total umbrage at what I did in the first story I ever got into fantasy and science fiction with, which was called Poe. P-O-E, 
white trash where I took Edgar <laughs> Allan Poe out for a bit of a spin in that same venue. But it's okay. You should see what I've done to the Northeast. Uh, so uh, anyhow, the, um, the young Harvard man who has got a very highfalutin vocabulary because he is other people's idea of what a Harvard man (laughs) is like, um, winds up meeting a lovely young woman. However, at that point, well, as I said, hijinks ensue, and it's not just the potato salad that goes all to pieces, (laughs) believe me. I have too much fun writing these. Well, it was a lot of fun to read, and I I really liked... um, like you mentioned there, um, <clears throat> like you, yeah, the sort of the caricature that the North thinks about trailer parks in the South is being very religious and that, that old time religion, but it's a, it's a different old time religion, real old time. But I think my, I think my favorite line, I'll spoil it, but that's okay, is, um, when they're talking about <clears throat> how, you know, all the, all those, fancy pants you know people up in the north they think they know you know know everything about the elder gods with their yale divinity school and you know i thought that was uh i I know a guy who went to yale divinity school so it was pretty i thought that was funny so um anyways um you mentioned um noir uh a noir cthulhu story and we have a kind of noir or hard-boiled detective cthulhu story in here by laura resnick who happens to be on the line luckily so um this is cthulhu pi and um i i've i think i've said this on the podcast my dirty secret is that i like crime fiction and mystery fiction as much as i like science fiction um and so this was a, a blast to read um this is sort of a uh it's a lovecraft parody and a raymond chandler parody sort of in a way and um laura i just wondered how that Again, it's kind of the same thing if you want to just set it up for us. And I'm just curious how that those two elements um, merged together in your mind when you were, when you were coming up with an idea for this. Uh, well, as I said, when Alex um, sent me the invitation, I'd never even read Lovecraft, but I didn't tell him <laughs> that. And I said, sure, I'll do that. And, in <laughs> fact, normally if somebody invites me into an anthology for something I don't no, like, you know, a series of novels that are the uh, inspiration for the stories. I say no, because I don't have time to read three or four novels or even one novel just to write a short story. I have to schedule my time better than that. But one thing I did know about Lovecraft was it was all short fiction. So I thought, well, that would be pretty easy to fit in, and I would kind of fill in that gap in my reading background, it's sort of a a good excuse to have to read some Lovecraft now, which I hadn't done. Um, And so I didn't really have an idea at the time, because other than having seen those internet memes about Cthulhu, I really didn't know anything. And I got out of the library just some classics um, like The Call of Cthulhu and um, At the Mountains of Madness and a couple of others. And um, it's funny, Esther talking, you, you and Esther talking about the language, because one reason that I write comedy is so many things strike me as just innately funny. And Love's, Lovecraft struck me as innately funny, because, <laughs> you know, the long, long, like you said, it's like a, a thesaurus vomited on the page. And that was exactly <laughs> what I found it like to read him. And I would actually be like reading these, you know, descriptions in the, it was like the first person narrative he does of these absolutely horrified people on the verge of losing their minds over this horror they've encountered. And I would just start cracking up and I would be like counting the adjectives. How many does he have in this sentence? (laughs) And I would be counting within a story. How many times does he use the word nameless or unnamed mm-hmm. or unnameable? And I'd be like, come on, dude, name it, name it, go for it. And I just found it hilarious. So it was pretty easy to figure out, well, what am I going to do funny out of this? Because um, no disrespect to people who enjoy Lovecraft in a more serious way, but I really got a kick out of it. And I'd be reading these long descriptions about how unthinkably, unimaginably, namelessly, unnamedly horrible something was, and I'd find myself blurting, okie dokie. <laughs> it just struck me as very funny. So, And this image kind of just popped into my head, because I am a, a big fan of um, crime fiction and mystery fiction and um, noir and old hard-boiled detective stuff. 
And just this image popped into my head of Cthulhu uh, with all those tentacles, you know, sitting in his uh, little private detective, uh, Raymond Chandler-style, Philip Marlowe type of office with his feet or um, limbs, I guess, propped up on a desk. And, you know, a very stereotypical long-legged blonde client with ulterior motives walks in. And the nice thing about a short story, because it's short, you can kind of go with that initial uh, idea or image or moment and see where it leads you, whereas with a novel you have to then figure out, well, how am I actually going to get 100,000 words out of that? But with a short story you can just write the opening scene and see, well, what do I get out of this? And so I just... Having immersed myself in like a bunch of Lovecraft short fiction, I was able to kind of, it's like you roll around and pick up all the sharp pieces and then you dump them into the story. So different characters and um, tropes and um, locations from this Lovecraft reading I've been doing just kind of wind up in the story. Um, and that was really just kind of the origin for it. And in the... The reason that Cthulhu is a private eye now in uh, my story is um, uh, tourists discovered, how do you say it, Rilia or whatever, the the undersea uh, domain that he inhabits. Now, cruise ships stop there daily, and it's overrun (laughs) with tourists. So marketing companies got involved, and they made a deal with Cthulhu for use of his image, but he had a bad lawyer, so now... The marketing company completely controls Cthulhu's image to the point where he is not allowed to use his image in any way, even to the extent of showing himself in person anywhere. So he had to start a whole new life on another continent, and that's how he wound up as a private eye in Innismoth. And a beautiful, long-legged blonde walks into his uh, office with a case for him, and that's sort of where the story kicks off, and she's not what she seems, and so on and so forth. So it was fun to, to work on, and it was fun to finally read some Lovecraft. Uh, yeah, I think it worked well, and I think, you know, it's interesting because in a way, I'm trying to think, I guess Lovecraft and Chandler probably didn't overlap a ton, but Lovecraft and Hammett certainly did. They were writing at the same time. So in a way, this is um, sort of very appropriate to mix those two things together, and I think it worked out well. Um, we're kind of running low on time. Alex, I wanted to just quickly talk with you if you wanted to, um, you know, unfortunately there's, you know, what, 20 people in this book. We can't have them all on the podcast. Um, if you wanted to talk about just shortly some of the other stories that are in here, there's Neil Gaiman's got a story. Uh, Ken Liu is in here. Mike Resnick. Um, a lot of other, uh, Nick Mamatas, a lot of other writers. Um, did you want to talk about any of those stories just very briefly, uh, here on the podcast? Sure. Well, one of the funnest things about working on this project is seeing just how ridiculous a situation uh, you know, some, some of the authors can create, how unusual a situation they can put Cthulhu or Lovecraft himself through. Uh, so some of the stories, I mean, you have a story in the book by David Wan where um, elder gods are uh, piloting a Star Trek-type starship. So, so you have a science fiction story. With uh, you know, which is completely ridiculous, of course, but it's done so so well, and it's actually this author's first professional sale. So I'm very excited to uh, to, to publish him. Um, there is a story uh, in, in in the book where Elvis is a Cthulhu doll, which the cover artist has done a great job of of, of playing with as well. Uh, there is a story where uh, you know Nick Mamatas's story is a sequel to his very successful novel. Uh, I Am Providence that came out last year, and he actually wrote uh, The Further Adventures of the Main Character, so anybody who's read that novel will especially enjoy uh, his story, even though it does stand alone if you haven't read the book. Uh, so there's all of these different takes uh, on, on, on on the subject. Uh, Cam Liu and Amanda Helm both write uh, stories where uh, there's various legal uh, situations that are involved. So in Cam Liu's story, uh, there's essentially a, a, a character that works for, for a very thinly veiled uh, version of Disney, uh, finds Cthulhu and tries to figure out how to, you know, how to make him an attraction. Uh, where in, in Amanda Helm's story, uh, there are lawyers battling Cthulhu, which at that point, I'm not sure who you're supposed to root for. <laughs> you know, like, which, which one is a lesser evil here? Uh, and and there's, there's all sorts of other uh, takes and tales in here, and each one of them uh, really takes take, take, takes the story in a completely different direction. So I think anyone who enjoys Cthulhu or who thinks that 
uh, Lovecraftian Uber is as funny as the authors you both can think uh, it is, uh, will really enjoy this book. I mean, I, I've tried to really straddle the line between uh, poking fun at, at, the, at, at the subgenre, but at the same time, remaining somewhat respectful to it as well. So, you know, so we want people who, uh, who are big fans of it to enjoy the book. But we also want people who kind of find it a little funny and a little ridiculous to enjoy the book as well. And and walking that fine line was probably the biggest challenge in in editing this anthology. And uh, it's up to the reader to decide whether uh, whether that whether that job was done well. Yeah, and I think I think it certainly was. It did nothing comes across to me as really mean spirited. I think, like you said, you walk that line between if you love Lovecraft, I think you'll like this, and if you kind of He's never been your thing. You've always found it a little silly. This would also play well to to you. So um, you also, I, in just in closing, I want to mention, <clears throat> you mentioned the cover. I don't know who remembers listening to this podcast. Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass had that album, Whipped Cream and Other Delights. And there was, and there was this very attractive young woman on the cover covered in whipped cream. And this sold, I think that album literally outsold any album by the Beatles in the 1960s. That's how popular it was. And Herb Alpert, when he would come on stage and they would play live, they would say, um, this is from Whipped Cream and Other Delights. I'm sorry, we can't play the album cover for you. So I'm going to say to the podcast listeners, I'm sorry that we can't, over the over the podcast, show you the cover of this book because it is hilarious. Um and Elvis Cthulhu is all I'll say. And uh, but I think go online when you go online to Bain eBooks or wherever you buy books to purchase this because you're going to want to buy it. Uh, I think you'll enjoy seeing that cover. So, um, well, uh, in closing, uh, I just want to say thanks to all my um, guests here today, uh, to Alex Schwartzman and uh, Jenny Koch, Jody Lynn Nye. Laura Resnick and Esther Friesner. It was great to have you on and to talk about H.P. Lovecraft and uh, the Cackle of Cthulhu, which is out now in trade paperback and ebook from Bain. Uh, thanks so much for being on, everybody. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thanks. Thank fun. you. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corville desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mounted armed attacks on others of Corville's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. Chapter 22 The Happy Occasion Langlast Port The flowers were quite shameless. A large bowl of bright red, yellow, and blue globes, each almost as big as Patty's head. They added a faintly sweet scent to the room's atmosphere, which mixed well with that of fresh baked bread. I hope you will find everything to your satisfaction, Unette Hartensis said, guiding her to the tiered buffet tables near the back of the room. The flowers were displayed on their own table, halfway between the entrance and the food. The trade displays were arranged artfully among the tables of food and drink. 
They will draw the guests further in, Unet Hortensis said, apparently intercepting her glance at the flowers and reading a question there. Once they find the flowers, then they will find the food, which is your ship's gift to them, and the trade information you have provided. Now, you will wish to sample what we have to be certain that all is to your liking. Please, take up a dish and allow me. Obediently, Patty picked up a bright red plate and allowed Unet Hartensis to place bits of vegetables and dribbles of sauces on it. She tasted carefully. The orange vegetables were sweet, the green ones spicy, the yellow bland. Eklist, Kobrok, Snowitz, the caterer murmured the name of the vegetables as Paddy tasted each one. The sauces, merely sweet, sour, hot, and cream, did not, in Paddy's opinion, improve the taste of the vegetables. But if sauce was local custom, then so be it. These are good, she said. The vegetables are very fresh. They came in this morning from our grower, Unet Hartensis said, with what Paddy heard as pride. She picked up a small cup, turning toward the beverage table, and hesitated, glancing over her shoulder to Paddy. You must forgive me, traitor. Langlast enforces an age law with regard to the consumption of wine and other spirits. May I ask if you are above 19 standards? I have but 17 standards, she said, which was near enough, and did not add that she had been drinking wine since she had achieved 14 standards. It would make no difference to the local law, and she, for one, had no wish to be arrested by port security ever again. I, however, father said from her right hand, I'm in my dotage and would welcome a taste of the summer wine. Unet Hartensis smiled at him, amused, Paddy thought. Amused and something else. She poured the wine generously and offered it to him, her fingers lingering needlessly against his. Father did not seem to notice anything amiss, merely smiled and sipped, his head tipped slightly to a side. Ah, he said after a long moment, that is very pleasant, Chef Hartensis. I don't suppose you offer any of this vintage on the market. You flatter me, traitor. I am no chef, merely one who arranges entertainments. As for the vintage... She sighed and looked regretful. The summer blend is one of our local treasures and may not be sold for off-world trade. I understand entirely, father murmured. I wonder, may I purchase a bottle or two for my own table? The caterer's face lit in a wide smile. You may purchase as many as six bottles at any duty-free shop which also offer other of Langlast's treasures for personal use only. Thank you, father said, answering her smile. He drank the last of the wine in the glass and glanced about him, perhaps for a tray on which to deposit it. Allow me, Unet Hartensis said, taking the glass from his hand, her fingers again lingering along his. Patty felt her breath go short, which was absurd and a decidedly odd sensation in the area of her stomach, and wondered if one of the sauces had disagreed with her digestion. Patty, father said, would you care for something to drink? The peculiar feeling exploded into embarrassment, and she looked up at him, feeling her face flame without precisely knowing why. And here then was Unet Hartensis exclaiming and turning toward her, Trader, please forgive me. You must of course taste our own Montora juice. She placed father's glass on the edge of the table, snatched up another, and poured blue juice from one of several pitchers. Thank you, 
Patty murmured, hoping that the juice would soothe her. She took a sip and almost gasped aloud at the astringent taste. Montora juice is served to guests of formal dinners after each course is removed. It cleans the palate wonderfully, the caterer said. Do you find it so? Indeed, Patty was able to say somewhat breathlessly, a very cleansing beverage. Unette Hartensis smiled and waited, by which Patty realized that she was expected to finish what remained in her glass. She did so, managing to keep her breath this time, and the caterer took the glass, her fingers impersonal and brisk. Now I know you will want to sample the sweets, Unette Hartensis said, glancing over her shoulder, perhaps meaning to include Father in her invitation. But Father had left them, he was moving toward the front of the room and the double doors through which their guests would come. Shortly, Paddy thought, glancing at the clock above the door as she followed the caterer to the sweets table. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to main intern Charlie Smith, and the podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkowitz. And the milk left over for the cats after the Milky Way reaches its expiration date and is replaced on the shelf with an exact replica galaxy. Only this one is 2%. And thanks, Roars Cree Decors, and praise of grateful Miskatonic U grads everywhere for Alex Schwartzman, Esther Friesner, Jody Lynn Nye, Gina Koch, and Laura Resnick, the editor and authors of The Cackle of Cthulhu. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 